Every once in a while, something very special happens when the right people are all in the right place at the right time together. This was the case in Canterbury, Kent, England in the late 60s and early 70s. Something strange and beautiful took hold in the quiet, conservative town and spawned a musical oddity that would be remembered for decades to come as the Canterbury scene. In this video, I'd like to dedicate some time to exploring some of the musicians who made up the Canterbury scene, and what each of them brought with them into their legendary jam sessions and meticulously sculpted albums. In the late 1300s, Geoffrey Chaucer wrote a collection of tales dubbed the Canterbury Tales, which was comprised of 24 folkloric stories, each told by a unique character. The Canterbury scene is something like a psychedelic, sonic variation on this theme, carried across time by the spirit of Canterbury. The Canterbury scene was composed of numerous bands, and often the groups would share members with one another, forming a roving, rotating cast of characters. Much like the raucous cast of the Canterbury Tales, the scene was teeming with the voices of distinct characters, all synergizing and bringing their unique, personal musical interpretations into the fold. What I'd like to do in this video is highlight some of the main musicians in the Canterbury scene, and we'll take a look at what each one brought to the table to help us understand the scene as a whole. The prototypical Canterbury band was an early group called the Wild Flowers. Though very few recordings from the band's existence, spanning from 1964 to 67, survive, they are often credited in starting the scene, and introduce Kent to the elements that would soon become the musical architecture of the Canterbury scene. The members of the Wild Flowers would become some of the most important musicians in developing the scene's diverse sensibilities, each of them going on to be involved with numerous other bands around Canterbury and beyond to further expand their sonic vocabulary. So let's start out with Kevin Ayers, who was the lead vocalist of the Flowers and would go on to help found Soft Machine and lead an influential solo career, acting as a potent bonding agent for much of the scene as a whole. Aside from his songwriting proclivities and instrumentality, Ayers was foundational in his ability to connect with other musicians and bring them into the merry troupe of the Canterbury Proggers. Throughout his extensive solo career, he would work with many of the other groups in the scene in one way or another, and would go on to work with the likes of Elton John, Brian Eno, Nico, Sid Barrett, and many other extra Canterbury musicians. His early solo records, like Joy of a Toy, which is also the name of an excellent Soft Machine song, would be instrumental in cementing the unique blend of experimental jazz noodling and pop-centric melodic songwriting that pervades the sound of many of the Canterbury groups. Robert Wyatt, another musician of Wildflower's pedigree, acts as a somewhat tragic centerpiece to the scene. After his stint in the Wild Flowers, Wyatt would join Kevin Ayers and a couple of fellow Flowers in Soft Machine as a drummer and vocalist before being forced out of the band due to internal conflicts. From that point he would go on to produce solo material and eventually formed his own well-regarded group, Matching Mole. Wyatt was influential in drawing down the folk-inspired melodicism and the characteristic whimsy of the Canterbury crowd including his love of nursery rhymes and other folk stories. The vein of folk inspiration is something that ran through Canterbury and is prevalent in the works of many of the bands, much owing to Wyatt's influence. While touring in support of the Jimi Hendrix experience in the late 60s, Wyatt has said that he took to heavy drinking, partially under the influence of Keith Moon, which would ultimately lead to an accident at a London party. An inebriated Wyatt fell from a fourth story window breaking his back and slipping into a six-week-long unconsciousness. Uh, when he finally came to, he woke to a new life as a paraplegic. Quite a tragedy for such a prolific drummer. However, this accident would be far from the end of Wyatt's career. As a solo artist, he would go on to work with many of the greats, including David Gilmour, Nick Mason, Bjork, Brian Eno, and John Cage, as well as release a slew of solo albums where he sometimes played and orchestrated every instrument. 
So cautionary tale aside, Wyatt's musical influence would be one of the early defining factors within the Canterbury scene. Richard Sinclair, yet another member of the Wildflowers, was, along with his cousin Dave Sinclair, also a forming member of the important, though relatively short-lived Canterbury band, Caravan. Sinclair wrote and sang several songs on Caravan's 1971 album, In the Land of Grey and Pink, often regarded as one of the greatest albums to come out of the Canterbury scene. Among the songs composed by Sinclair are Golf Girl, Winter Wine, and the title track of the album. I think that his influence on the scene really comes through when you look at songs like these. There's a strong sense of pop rock songwriting, a tendency to more relatable topics, and it still preserves the fantasy aesthetic. This likely comes from the fact that his father had played in a dance band, and Sinclair strove to maintain a sense of danceability in his own music, though this was surely warped from what one would regularly expect from dance music in the 70s. After leaving Caravan in 1972, Sinclair formed Hatfield in the North, another quintessential Canterbury band, along with Pie Hastings and Phil Miller, where he took part in some of their most well-known songs, lending his recognizable vocals and burgeoning bass guitar skills. Later, he would also play with Camel, a Canterbury-adjacent band sometimes included alongside the scene due to elements of their sound and personal relationships with members of the Canterbury scene. Steve Hillage is best known in the scene for his guitar playing prowess, playing at times with Caravan and Spyrogyra performing the band Khan with Nick Greenwood, formerly of the crazy world of Arthur Brown. He would go on to be influential in the band Gong, one of my personal favorites from the scene, and play with many of the other bands in the scene, including Kevin Ayers and Mike Oldfield, as well as a ton of other groups outside of Canterbury. One of Hillage's most important contributions, in my opinion, are his thematic contributions to the scene. Hillage, along with other members of Gong, like David Allen, who we'll get to in a second, dabbled in New Age and esoteric themes, as well as elements of Eastern religion that brought along traditionally Eastern musical styles and scales. The influence of raga and other music exotic to the men and maids of Kent would have a huge influence on the other bands in the scene, and formed an interesting dialectic with the folkloric English themes also prevalent in the scene. These themes helped to catapult the scene into a more psychedelic direction, and that would prove to be influential in the decades to come. So while we're on the subject of gong, we should take a look at Hillage's gong bandmate David Allen. David Allen is an especially interesting figure within the Canterbury scene. He's an Australian-born poet who only moved to Kent after traveling to Paris to visit the Beat Hotel. The Beat poets, especially Allen Ginsberg and William S. Burroughs, were a huge influence on Allen, and the distinctive Beat mentality would become an important aspect of many of the Canterbury bands. In fact, Soft Machine was named for a Burroughs novel of the same title. Allen formed Soft Machine along with Wyatt and Ayers in 1966, and introduced the scene to the beat-style poeticism and psychedelic mystical motifs that came with it. In 67, he would travel back to Paris where he formed Gong, making that group unique in that they were a Canterbury band that was not formed in Kent, while still being integral to the scene. And last but not least, I want to talk about Mike Oldfield. Mike Oldfield is an interesting figure in his relationship to the scene. He is sometimes excluded from mention in discussions revolving around the Canterbury scene, as he was never directly in a Canterbury band, though he did sometimes play and record with Kevin Ayers, Robert Wyatt, and others. However, I do think that he's worth mentioning as an important figure here. He was very influential in his early embrace of electronic elements in his music and his incredible musicianship on a vast number of instruments. Across his 26 solo albums and beyond, Oldfield can be heard playing just about any fretted instrument, from banjo to ukulele to guitar, as well as accordion, whistles, and recorders, keyboards and organs, programmed electronic instruments, violins, harps, all manner of percussion, and of course the tubular bells. Tubular bells would become the title of his vastly popular and influential debut album, I'm sure that you'll recognize the titular track from its use in the Exorcist films. 
Oldfield would carry many aspects of Canterbury Prague into his solo career, and it was these influences that would lead him to become a forerunner in the New Age music genre, which he is considered a founding figure of. During his career, he would cross paths with the men of Kent many times, and his influence can be felt throughout the scene, just as the proper Canterbury bands were influenced by his incredible career. Over the years, the Canterbury label would be used almost as a genre description, sometimes placed on bands who had nothing to do with the Canterbury scene other than taking notes from the sound of these bands. Meanwhile, many of the Canterbury bands would move towards other genres as their careers progressed, some becoming even more experimental as they moved on to jazz fusion, new age, or music concrete, while others would go into a more pop rock and singer-songwriter direction. Now, taking a look at what each of these awesome musicians have brought to the scene, let's list off some of the defining aspects of the Canterbury scene, kind of as a summary. A somewhat pop-minded, danceable sense of rhythm and songwriting, where warranted. Jazz-inspired chords and rhythmic ideas. Use of exotic scales and musical modes use of jazz and folk instrumentation, along with typical rock instruments. Folkloric and fairy tale lyrical concepts, expressed with nursery rhyme whimsy. Mystical and new age spiritual iconography and mindset to the creative process of making music. Psychedelic imagery and ideations, many of which would be influential on later psychedelic music a beat poet approach to sound generation and brash experimental songwriting processes, along with a focus on jamming to discover new musical ideas. The Canterbury scene can be a tough nut to crack. It took me a while to understand what was so special about this collection of artists and the music that they produced. Honestly, on the first listen, some of this stuff can come off as kind of really hard to the ears. But that is by design. If you listen to what these guys have to say, they make it pretty clear that the Canterbury scene isn't just for easy listening. David Allen revels in the fact that some of his music is uncomfortable to listen to, and that's all part of the beauty of it. It's a readaptation of, of jazz and fusion and so on. I tend to think it's confusion, though. See, I, that's for the reason why I call it confusion, or even infusion, perhaps on a politer day. Well, it's definitely not your... Uh straight jazz. There are solid songs, like on Hatfield and Norris' The Rotters Club, Caravans in the Land of Grey and Pink, and Ayer's Joy of a Toy. They're all albums with perfectly grounded, pleasant rock songs that more than prove that these musicians could write whatever kinds of music that they wanted to. But I think the far more interesting sounds come from albums like Soft Machine's third album, the Radio Gnome Trilogy of Gong, and the winding labyrinthine epics of Caravan or Khan's headiest offerings. The Canterbury scene was a rich and diverse group of musicians, and each one brought something irreplaceable to the bands that they made up. Each of the bands here is worthy of their own video at the very least, but I hope that this can serve as a decent introduction to what the scene is, who was involved with it, and what each of these incredible musicians brought to the table. I obviously wasn't able to go over every notable person in this video, so let me know in the comments below who I missed or if you'd like me to do a deeper dive on any of the people or bands that I did mention in this video. As always, thank you for checking out my video, and please leave a like and subscribe if you want more content on the progressive rock genre. Thank you. Hi, uh, if you've made it to the end of the video, I'd also like to make an announcement. I've set up a Patreon for the channel, and I hope that if you've been enjoying my content, you'll go and take a look at it. I'd like to be able to put a lot more time into making content for Is It Prog, but unfortunately it's a pretty time-intensive job, and due to the nature of making music-related content on YouTube, I usually can't monetize the videos, if I want to include music that is. So this is pretty demoralizing if I'm being honest, and though I'm not really doing this to make a bunch of money, it's hard to justify spending too much time making videos when I could be working on my own music or freelancing jobs to help pay for some of my bills or something like that. So I'm just going to put it out there that if you enjoy my content and would like to see more, you can join my Patreon. 
If I even get one patron, I'll pledge to make at least one all-out video a month, and I'll scale my efforts as things get moving. Over at the Patreon, you'll also receive some special perks like early access to videos, extra content, uh, your name in every subsequent video, and you'll really be helping me out. And I know that this is still a really small niche channel, and I get it if you're not willing to put any money down on something like this just yet. Either way, I'll continue to put out videos at a pace that makes sense for me, and I hope you'll come back and enjoy my next one.